<laughs> Hi. Sorry, they locked me out. It was. You know. um, uh, my uh, good afternoon. My ne or actually morning. We're still in the morning time. It's so early, you guys. I am so impressed to see this turnout this early in the morning. Um, such an indication of how much everybody loves today's guest, though. Um, we have here today actor, writer, director, producer, Bostonian John Krasinski. Um, someone who has been a favorite of so many people since breaking through in his Emmy-nominated SAG award-winning role as Jim Halpert on The Office. And I genuinely don't know if anybody is having a better year than this guy. Um, <laughs> a Quiet Place was the rare commercial hit, as beloved by audiences as it is by critics, and he is now headlining the Amazon series ja uh, yeah, Jack Ryan. I almost said John Ryan. That's the sequel. Um, <laughs> please welcome John Krasinski. Hi. Hi. I'll be John Ryan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the spinoff. <laughs> I star in my own spinoff? What? Yeah, could you do that? Yeah, you we can just do did. I think we just did. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody, well, thanks for coming out on an yeah, early it's morning. Crazy. It was great. Yeah. I already told him there's more people here than there were for Hugh Jackman, so he's <laughs> winning. <Yeah. laughs> Not supposed to be competitive, but. Oh. How's that feel, Hugh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is an audience of SAG actors, mm -hmm. uh, so I always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> I love my SAG card story because I got my SAG card doing a commercial. I was in college and drove back to Boston on the weekends to do whatever commercials I could. I was an extra, and then I was, be, I was asked to be a featured extra um, and be checking out a woman at the counter. And that woman ended up being Margot Martindale. You're kidding. Yeah, so my first job was with my later uh, movie mom. And uh, when we did the hollers together, we talked about it. And I, I'd seen her a couple times, but we talked about how my first so moment crazy. acting was with her, yeah. Did you tell her, someday I'm going to direct you? She tells this story, and <laughs> I can't even repeat it without laughing, because I can't believe it's true. But it, she did say to me that day, she said, I'm not a betting woman, but if I had any money, I'd bet it all on you. I think you're going to be a big star. And she told that story when we did the hollers, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so um, I owe her 10%, and yes, uh, really. she's doing fine. You did a lot of commercials early on, didn't I? I did. I mean, I did. I, I thought it was a lot. I think it was like five or six. So yeah. I was like, this is it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I did a lot of weird commercials. I, I remember I did one commercial for Kodak where, uh, please don't go searching for it. <laughs> Let's just leave it where it is. Um, but there was, it was two roommates who were playing pranks on each other and one shaved uh, one of his friends uh, in a reverse mohawk. Yes. And the other one shaved the other guy's eyebrow. Yeah. And my dad uh, is a doctor, he retired, but at the time he was a doctor. And I said, I, I got the, I, I'm up for this role. I don't know if I'm eyebrow guy or hair guy. <laughs> And he called me the morning of the, the news I hadn't heard yet. And he was like, so here's the deal. Talk to a couple doctors. The eyebrows can and cannot come back. That may or may not happen. So just pray your reverse mohawk guy. And I was like, wow. this put a damper on the day. <laughs> and so they were like, congratulations. And I was like, just get to the part of my eyebrow guy. Am I eyebrow guy? And they were like, no, you're reverse mohawk oh, guy. Oh, thank God. Like, yes. <laughs> and then as I was doing it to the real guy, I was like, oh, it's totally going to grow back. Yeah. Oh, you really did shave oh, it? Oh, yeah, I shaved his Oh, my eyebrow. God, that yeah. poor man. Yeah, we did one take. Yeah. <laughs> All you need is one. Yeah. All you need is one. And he was never heard from again. Mm -mm. Career was ruined by that one no, eyebrow. No. <laughs> well, no, I actually remember because we were introduced um, at the Kinsey premiere years ago. Oh my God, yeah, yes. by my friend who does a lot of commercials, who I think had worked with you. That's right. Yeah, and I said, What is now? I realized the dumbest thing ever because I was friends with Jenna Fisher through theater. And right. she said, This is John. He's just been cast in the new office pilot. And I was like, Oh, have you worked with this girl, Jenna Fisher? And you. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. I, she's my TV wife. Yes. And you, no, you played it so cool. You were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know her. And yeah. then I see the show and I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. That's <laughs> what I was hoping you'd feel. Yeah. <laughs> it paid off. A year later, I felt the shame. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Uh, so I want to go back, actually, and start at the beginning. Um, you were born and raised in Boston. We're going all the way back. We're going all yes. the way back. Born and raised in Boston, yeah. <laughs> when did you first know you wanted to be an actor? Were you the kid who did school plays or? No, I, you know, funnily enough, the, the first big acting thing I had was in high school, I basically played basketball and I ran cross country to get in shape for basketball. 
And so I really didn't have any access to, you know, I'd seen plays and done all this stuff, but I was really kind of out of any artistic universe. And then BJ Novak, who went to high school with me, um, <laughs> came up to me and he said, we're doing this thing, we're reviving this thing called The Senior Show. And I had heard about it in lore, where the seniors write this giant parody on the school and the teachers love it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, BJ was like, we're going to revive it. It went down because some kid was too controversial and we're going to do it five years later and I want you to be the lead of it, one of the leads of it. And I remember asking him, what are you, crazy? And he was like, no, 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 trust me, you can do this. And so that was my first kind You're of kidding. gig. Yeah. And then I went to college and somewhere in the back of my mind thought, maybe I can play basketball in college? And um, I came in as a mid-year at Brown University and so they had this mid-year program and obviously the the uh, basketball season was already midstream, but I went up to meet the coach and I actually opened the door uh, and everybody was practicing and as the door opened and by the time it shut, I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, nope, I don't want to do this. I don't do this. <laughs> you guys look like you've been up too long. Yeah. Looks like you guys are working out, don't want anything to do with that. And then um, as I was walking back from that uh, moment at the gym, I remember there was a uh, flyer on a tree, which was a big deal at Brown. I remember being like, you can't nail things to trees. <laughs> Especially at Brown. Everybody <laughs> needs to know that. Yeah, so I pulled this flyer down for a sketch comedy group and I went and auditioned and completely changed my life. And I remember I, I went to audition because I wanted to be in that community. Really? And that's kind of the reason why I keep doing what I'm doing because the only reason I'm here is because of all the friends and, and incredible support system I've had from the beginning. I'm still trying to get over the fact you went to high school with B.J. Novak. I know, yeah. It's so <laughs> random, yeah. We'll just pause for yeah. like 10 minutes to like go over it. Yeah, no, it's, it was really weird. And when I saw him at the audition for The Office, it was one of those things because he was all theater all the time in high school and he was really good. And so when I saw him in the audition room, I got called back, you know, the like fl flown to L.A. to do the test, mm -hmm. which is terrifying. And I walked in the room and he was like, hey man. I was like, oh, well, there it goes. <laughs> there goes the part. And I was like, what part are you going up for? And he's like, Ryan. And I was like, oh, not mine. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. We're going to be fine. It's going to be just fine. Yeah. Had you kept in touch over the years or was that sort I of I had the first seen time? him a couple yeah. times. And, you know, when you're, when you're from the same hometown, yeah. I think like more you hear about him of through course. parents and different things. And it, you know, yeah. BJ's doing really yeah, yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Didn't need to know that. Yeah. <laughs> And is it true at Brown, did you major in playwriting? Well, what happened was you, you, there's a, the only way you can uh, major in writing at Brown at the time, I don't know if it's changed, was you had to go into the honors program. And the only way to do that was to get your degree early. So I declared myself as an English major. And you have to go through the entire English major before you can even apply to be a writer. Wow. Which is kind of, I realized later, like I was a junior, like wait, I'm only deciding on my life now? Yeah. And so I applied to the program and I got in and I was one of a couple kids that got into the playwriting program and it was, it was phenomenal. So were you actually writing and performing plays? Yes. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the crazy thing about Brown for me was I had sort of, there were two educations, right? The, the school's one of the best educations you can get for sure, but the education I benefited most from was I was a kid who probably had never really seen many movies that weren't in the Cineplex and I hadn't heard music that wasn't on uh, the radio and so my biggest education was my first week when I met these kids when I got into the sketch comedy group and Finally got into this theater group. I said can you know to like seven of my closest friends Can you give me an album and a movie every week that I should see and for four years? These kids wow. gave me a new album and a new movie that I should see and I, I mean it It was the most transformative time in my life artistically and no drugs necessary. I was just like, my, my brain exploded every single night, and I'll, I'll never forget that. No drugs necessary, but still optional. Optional, yeah. for <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I it, it just kept watching movies at night and listening to music, and I remember the, I actually remember the first album was uh, uh, Nick Drake, and I remember just sitting on the floor of my room being like, oh, got it. So there's a whole new world yeah. out there. Yeah. What were some of the movies that influenced you during that time? Well, it was amazing because it was a bunch of different things. There was like some French New Wave stuff, but also my friends were, n <laughs> were very kind not to just like explode my brain from the beginning <laughs> um, and be like, have you seen Fellini? And you're like, no, it's too much. But I remember uh, Noah Baumbach's uh, Kicking and Screaming was one of the Big first one, movies yeah. I saw that they gave me. Um, this movie, Safe Men, has anybody seen Safe Oh my gosh, with Sam Rockwell. It's one of my favorite movies yes. of all. If you haven't seen it, it is legit, like, Big Lebowski level good. It is so brilliant. It was Mark Ruffalo, um, uh, Sam Rockwell, Steve Zahn, Paul Giamatti. I think it was all, like, their first movie. It yeah, was I insane. Giamatti. 
And uh, yeah, John Hamburg had directed it, and it was about the um, Jewish gangsters in Providence. And so being at Brown, I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> I'm a Jewish gangster. Yeah. Now. <laughs> um, everyone who was like in sketch groups in high school and college, they always had like those funny names. What was your guys' name? Uh, out of Bounds. Oh, that's not bad, it's actually. It's not bad, right? No, it's pretty no. smart. It's kind of out there. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Really I actually good. can't make fun of that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. So did you also study acting when you were there, or was it mainly through the sketch I took group? a couple classes, but to be honest, it was such a competitive um, place to be for acting. I mean, again, the kids who were going in, in the theater program at Brown, at least when I was there, was they were all so phenomenal mm -hmm. and so inspiring. So I watched a lot of theater. I painted a lot of sets. I lit a lot of sets. I did whatever I could. It, it truly was one of those things where we also had the most amazing student theater um, one of the first things, actually one of the first thing I was ever asked to do anything other than like arm guard number four <laughs> was um, Chris Hayes, who's on MSNBC, uh, is, uh, was a director and friend at Brown. And he was one of the first people who ever, like BJ, saw that I could do something more. And so he came up to me and he said, I'm going to do this stage reading of this book and you have to be in it. And I thought, this is great. Um, and he said, it's called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. And it's oh, written wow. by this guy, David Foster Wallace. And that was one of the things that I think if you go back and say, when did you decide that acting would be something you'd want to do for the rest of your life? That was the moment. Because I realized up until then, I was just trying to entertain people. I was trying to make people laugh. And what Brief Interview showed me is it moved people. I, I had never seen an audience get so um, upset, thrilled, mm -hmm. all these different things. It's very hard material. It's really dark stuff. And yet people were engaged and either you saw the message that was in these words or you felt sort of repulsed by this message. And I'm not saying it's like an Andy Kaufman level, you know, any reaction is a good reaction, but it was one of those things where the next day, I think our theater held like 100 kids and 250 people showed up. And I remember thinking that was pretty wild. And the next day a teacher walked by me and said, that was the best thing the student theater's ever done. And I thought, wow, it's great. And then after the next class, a teacher came up and said, that's not at all what Brown's about. You shouldn't be doing things like that. And I wow. thought, whoa, we're sort of on to something here. <laughs> also, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> what are you, putting nails in trees? Get out of here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's when you sort of made the decision to pursue this as a career? I knew I wanted to give it a shot. So what happened was because I was a mid-year um, at Brown, all my friends graduated in the spring, but I had one more semester to make up. And, you know, truly out of kind of sheer laziness, I didn't want to be on the campus without my friends. Mm -hmm. And I felt like um, I wanted to do something new. I was always trying to do things a little, I started school young only because of my age, not because I was like some genius, because my mom saw all my friends going to school and she was like, and you're going to. It doesn't matter how old you are, just get into kindergarten. Um, but it was one of those things where uh, I had heard about this school called the National Theater Institute at the Eugene O'Neill Center in Connecticut. And I applied because, again, out of laziness, I thought, well, that's one of the only places I've heard the transfers credits back, that they mm. actually accept, uh, Brown will accept that. So I thought, great, I'll just do that. And I was always planning on being a teacher. And in those 14 or 16 weeks, um, that was it. I mean, mm. I, I, yeah, I met, I remember, it, it, but it wasn't just because I fell in love with acting, it's because I fell in love with the idea of having to work hard for it. And they, that's the whole program. They, they said, you will wake up every morning. We were waking up every morning at like 5.30 or 6, and we were going to bed every night at like 2 a.m. because you were directing, producing, painting sets. You were doing everything, and they wanted you to know that this is a community that you are lucky to be in. And so if you, are, uh, you, if you have the distinct honor of being in that group, you need to work hard for it. And I remember thinking, this is it. Like, this is that kind of fire that I've never felt before. And um, it was there that I, I actually declared that I wanted to be an actor. My mom picked me up after the final project, and we hadn't left the parking lot. And I said, I'm going to move to New York, and I'm going to be an actor. And I think she hesitated for like 0.6 of a yeah. second, which was, you know, I have to give her so much credit for. And she said, great, go do it. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, because, you know, you did just spend a lot of money on an Ivy League <laughs> education, and I'm going to go be a professional waiter. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and she said, just do me one favor. If, you, if two and a half, three years, we used to fish as kids, and so she said, if two and a half, three years, if you don't have a bite, if you don't have a nibble, you got to make me one promise, which is that you'll pull yourself out, because the only thing I can't stand by and be a part of is you... Uh, is as your mom, I, I can't be asked to tell my son to give up on his dreams. Don't put me in that position. And I said, fair enough. Wow. And then two and a half years later, I called her and I had, had a great time in New York. I really, um, 
it was just the most mind-blowing time with friends and doing all this independent stuff. It was great. And then I called and I just said, you're right. I, I didn't have a bite and it's not for me. And I thought I had it and, and maybe I don't. And that's okay. And she said, oh, it's September. Just, you know, wait till the end of the year. Just, we'll talk about it at Christmas. And I went, all right, fine. And three weeks later, I booked the office. You're kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, you know, actually... Jenna has a similar story where she was going to go through one she last pilot that's, season. That's total BS. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crap. But I remember she was going to give up and do animal rescue. And yeah. And she, she went so like, it almost sounds like the office, like, I don't know if everyone else was like at the point where they were ready to give up or. I, you know, it's funny you say that though, because we all talk about it where, you know, Steve had done like FedEx commercials yep. and The Daily Show before he did our show. and. I, I remember he had just gotten Anchorman, and so Anchorman was yet to be released after our pilot. And before first season, I think he, I think it did come out. But there was, it was this feeling of we really felt like we were a repertory company. It felt like we were doing different plays every week for an audience. And if you were lucky enough to be there, we got to perform for you. We never thought it would go anywhere. I mean, we actually were, I, I've told this story many times, but we were not only threatened to be canceled, we were legit canceled every single Friday. So the first, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a joke, we, like the first, I think our pickup is tied for the lowest in history. Wow. I think Greg Daniels told us that we were picked up for four. And I think Greg was, you know, bold enough to say, I, I, you know, I'll, I won't do four, I'll do six. And so we had the first season was six which was amazing. And every single Friday, this amazing guy, I remember Jeff, he was this really handsome, cool guy from NBC being like, this is my favorite show. Unfortunately, the network doesn't see that. <laughs> um, you will not be doing this show. And then you'd get like a call on the weekend or kind of the comeback Monday, we'll give it another try. And I remember at the end of it, I, I went up to Jeff and I said, could you do me one favor? And he said, yeah. I said, I'm sure at NBC you can like print a DVD. And he said, uh, yeah, and I said, can you print a DVD of these six episodes? Because I just need to show my mom that this was real. So she doesn't think I was out here in LA wow. doing nothing. And he printed it and hand wrote um, the Office episodes one through six, and I still have it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's pretty well known that you actually thought this was a terrible idea to import the Office from the I, I thought the show was an amazing idea. Yeah. <clears throat> I, in my audition for it in New York, um, I was sitting next to six other gyms that looked <laughs> That's the worst. really, really good for the part. And they all went in and I was the seventh one and then the um, casting director in New York came up to me and said, all right, so we're just gonna break for lunch. And I thought, oh, is it, can we just do one more before everybody leaves? And just people coming out of offices for days. You just didn't know that there were that many people in this office and everybody went and got a salad or a sandwich down at 30 Rock. And I was sitting alone in this office for a long time just sweating. And then everybody rushes back in with all their, you know, whatever, like sweet greens or whatever it was at the time. And this guy sits right there and he's eating and he just said, you know, are you nervous? And I said, ah, no, you know, you either get these things or you don't. But what I'm really nervous about is, I mean, Americans just have such a, a you know, a habit of ruining great UK shows. And they're just, this is one of my favorite shows. They're going to ruin it because the, the UK one is perfect. And he goes, hi, I'm Greg Daniels. I'm the executive producer. <laughs> Wow. And I, le I legit threw up in my mouth. I was like. <laughs> and then he was like, I'll see you in there. And I was like. <laughs> and I went out in the hall and I called my manager at the time and I was like, so this is done. <laughs> and he was like, well, how bad can it be? And I told him and he was like, that's bad. That's <laughs> And then I went into the room and everybody was laughing very much like this at me, not with me. And it was one of those weird things where like when you, you know, anybody knows that the comedy's comedy no matter where yeah. it's coming from. And so I just did it. And to this day, Greg says it's one of the reasons why I got the part because, you know, you, you were honest and honesty is the best policy. And there was something about you that I liked that you weren't just doing whatever it took to impress me. And I thought, yeah, totally. That was all calculated. Yeah. <laughs> So now every time I go into yeah. a room, I'm like, this script sucks, <laughs> but I'll do it. I was going to say, so your audition advice is insult Exactly. Yeah, just yeah. insult everyone that looks at you. It will eventually pay off. <laughs> um, you sort of mentioned, like, I, I think people have a very different, um, they remember the show very differently because it's so iconic now, yeah. but this was before 40-Year-Old Virgin. Mm -hmm. This was, as you said, exactly, yep. cancel, almost cancel. When was the moment you started to realize it was... 
a thing. Oh, I remember the day uh, vividly. So I used to go to Toast, which was right near my house. Toast. Yeah, Toast is the best. <laughs> I love Toast. <laughs> now you can't get in. Every time I drive yeah. by, I'm like, there's 840 people trying to get iced coffee. <laughs> so I used to go in there every morning and, um, uh, you know, just I ordered an iced coffee and sat with my friend Danny and we were talking about a bunch of different stuff. And one day I walked in, I was laughing with Danny, and they had just aired Sexual Harassment, Mindy's episode she had written. Yes. And I walked in and I remember everybody in the place just went, and I went, oh my God, what, what's happening? Did I, did, am I not wearing pants? Like what's, <laughs> and then a bunch of people came up and said, we saw that episode, Sexual Harassment, it was really cool, and it was bold, and it was different, it was funny, and I thought, oh boy, that's a whole different thing. And then the other moment I remember that it was a totally different stratospheric thing was, we were lucky enough to come out at the same time as iTunes. And so I was walking through New York and a guy came up to me, had no idea what an iPod was. And he was like, hey man, you're on my iPod. And my brain exploded because he was holding some device that I thought was a bomb or something. <laughs> and then my face is on like an yep. inch by inch screen. And I thought, this is, this is very bizarre. And we realized that if, you, if we could get people to pay $1.99 for a show that they could watch for mm -hmm. free, that's when NBC was like, oh, Boy, all right, <laughs> fine, we'll pick it up, we'll do it, yeah, and that's when everything changed. At least Jeff was happy. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah Jeff was like, great. No, but it's funny, because we always talk about it that, you know, whenever you see award speeches or whatever, people always say, you know, we owe everything to our fans. We legitimately owe everything to our fans. I can honestly say that this, sh our show is as much yours as it is ours. You created what we have. You gave us the opportunity because you legitimately voiced your opinion to say we love this show and so it was kind of the beginning of like voting your favorite people on on the air we feel like we just uh, won a lottery ticket do you have a favorite memory of your time on the show oh my god it's one of the, you know what's funny is i remember i was at some award show and somebody came up to me and was like uh, what season is it and i said um we're in the fifth season and whoever it was said oh this is the <laughs> one oh, no. and i went oh what's the one and he goes where you all start hating each other I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, like everybody will start to do other things and you all dissipate and go other places. And, you know, we had all started working on other stuff, but I'm pretty sure everybody on the show will, will legitimately say it was the best time of our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, from, from day one to day the end, it was, it was a perfect existence. And so, I mean, if you watch any bloopers online, I mean, my favorite moments were certainly laughing. Yeah. I mean, getting to laugh with these people and getting to be a part of something where you knew that if you weren't on the show, you would be the most diehard fan at home watching it. And I thought that was just so unreal to me. And that's why I broke every time. And people are like, wow, you're the most unprofessional actor ever. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, you try working with Steve Carell. He's, it's say. ridiculous. <laughs> and he's just so brilliant and smart and just a fireball of comedy and energy and it's actually it's funny I was actually talking about it yesterday or two days ago on on set I someone asked me about the office and how it all ended and oh I was talking to uh, Michael Kelly House of Cards just ended oh. and Michael Kelly's yeah. on our show in season two which was amazing and Wendell Pierce is everything and he's on our show and we were talking about the end of the wire and the end of House of Cards because um, Mike was just doing Michael was doing a uh, press and I said he said how did the office end I said, I'll never forget that Greg did the, Greg directed the last episode, thank God, it sort of felt perfect. And he directed the episode that everybody, he kind of left this insert shot of all of us leaving and going to poor Richard's bar. And he said, oh yeah, I have to do this shot at the end. And so we were all there laughing. And if anybody knows, it's like when you're in a group scene and you know that it's gonna be used for two seconds, you kind of are like, whatever. And we're walking out, we're joking with each other and you round the corner, which is now like wood. <laughs> you know, it's like, it doesn't look like the set at all. And we're laughing and talking. And then when we came back in, he was in the middle of the set and we were joking and, and he turned and he said, well, that, that's the end of the office. And we were all together. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he didn't say like, this is John's last scene, now Jenna, and like yep. Rain being left till like 8 p.m. to shoot his last shot, that would have been awful. And he knew that if we were all together, and I'll never forget, people doubled over. Because we, we went from laughing with each other thinking we had another three hours to shoot. And then he said, that's the end of the office. And we all went, Oh my God, like it was just the most unbelievably intense and emotional uh, experience. Mm. You might have answered this earlier when you said Steve, but who made you break up the most? Because you had oh, so man. many scenes with Rain. <laughs> I did, yeah, and Rain and I had this weird thing where, I think he'd say the same thing too, it was just like a look <laughs> that he would give me and I would laugh all the time. I think it's in the bloopers, like he'll say something that he doesn't even look yeah. like he's breaking or anything. 
But there was just, you know, there really is such a thing as a twinkle in an eye. And like the difference between saying like, damn it, Jim, and then being like, damn it, Jim. And I'm like, okay, that was, <laughs> that was too much. It was too much, it was too much heat. Um, but no, I mean, I remember there were so many moments. Certainly, I think the hardest I laughed, damn near died, was uh, at dinner party when, when that, oh God. when he does that thing with the TV. <laughs> And he says, and then when guests come over, you can just yeah. I mean, I'm like right now thinking about it. It's like, that was the funniest thing I've ever witnessed in my life. Um, no, it was, it was crazy. And then the other thing was, uh, that's very true, is as much as I laughed, I, I, I cried the most with him too, because I think that we were both from Boston. We shared this thing. Listen, we all cried all the time. But when Steve left, that was actually the last scene of the day of Steve's last day. And I didn't realize that till later. You, you, people are like, look at a call sheet, man. Like, <laughs> sounds like you didn't know about this family thing. It's like not that big a deal. It's last on the call sheet, it's what you're shooting. Um, and so I go in to do this scene and it just hit me. It was like you were in the room and you were with Steve and Steve has been, had been really quiet all day, obviously, and very sweet, but very quiet. And I think we knew that this was it, and so we rolled, and I think, I think I remember the director telling me it was 17 takes before we got one word out. Wow. Because they called action, and it was like, uh, no. And it was so, I mean, and if you've seen the show, when I cry, I cry hard. Like, I laugh, cry, I cry, cry, I just, I cry whatever, whenever I get the opportunity. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a, there were a lot of retouches. I think that scene took like four and a half hours or something, yeah. <laughs> Um, didn't you audition with Rain? Is that true? Or you were paired together? Well, we, once we went to the test, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I auditioned with everybody. I mean, so we did, I remember Rain, it was one of those things where, you know, it sounds like a cliche or just revisionist history, but it's true. When you look at the moments, I remember the second I auditioned with Rain, Greg came out and said, uh, we're going to do this improv, and um, you have a Diet Coke in the refrigerator and you're asking him not to drink it and I said okay and we started doing this improv and as soon as we started doing it I legitimately was not only frustrated as Jim in the scene but I was super frustrated as John Krasinski for Rain Wilson screwing up this scene for me <laughs> because I was like hey so I just want to oh no I had to leave to I had to leave to go to the bathroom he had to man my phone that was the second improv and I said I'm just gonna go to the bathroom if you could just and he went mm, like that <laughs> And I was like, I was like, I get it, I get it, man. I just, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. It's like seven seconds, maybe 30, just, and he was like, <laughs> and like shutting all these doors. And by the end of it, I legitimately was like, I'm gonna punch you in the face. <laughs> you, but you. And then they were like, cut. I'm like, I'm not finished. This, this dude here. Um, and then I'll never forget meeting Jenna. She walked in the room, and it sounds like some romance, but it's true. She walked in the room. There were, the New York crew was first. The New York actors were first, and the L.A. Uh, actors were second, and all the New York actors had left but me. And I, I went on set finally and said, I think someone forgot to tell me to go home. <laughs> and they were like, nope, wait one sec. But when I met Jenna, she was coming in, and I saw her, and I just, I, just, I said, that's it. That's the girl who's going to get it. And so the whole day, I just said, if I could read with her, mm. I have a shot. If I don't, th there's no chance. And so I read with all these amazing actresses who were great, and I never read with Jenna. And that's when I went in wow. and said, you know, I think someone forgot to tell me to go home. And you heard these people, be, like, behind the wall being like, one sec, hold on a second. On. And then they said, Jenna, can you come in and read with John? And as soon as she sat down, I was like, I, I might have a chance at this. And she, you know, um, we did the little scene and as we were walking out, I said, you're gonna get this part. And she said, that's so crazy. I thought you were gonna get the part. And then when we both were told that we had the, the part, the first question we asked was, I said, did, did Jenna Fisher get the part? Because I thought if she does it, then, I, then we might be able to do something special. And if mm -hmm. somebody else got it, I, I'm pretty sure it will be canceled. <laughs> <laughs> um, wants to know, what was your relationship with the audition process? Were you a nervous auditioner? And what did you find that worked for you in auditions? Oh yeah, I was terrified. I, it was one of those things where I saw auditioning as this sort of wild animal that I could never get a relationship with. I couldn't figure out my in. I couldn't figure out how to drop in. I couldn't figure out how to be anchored. All these things that I had heard my friends talking about and I was like, I can't do it. I just get there and 
on a random occasion, I feel like, I think I, I think that went pretty well. Usually it was just sort of like, oh God, there's a lot of energy going different places and I don't know what's going on, but hopefully this worked out for all of us. Um, and it never did. Um, and then I, I swear, I was such a huge fan of stuff like this. And, and so I watched Inside the Actor's Studio all the time. I actually taped it on VHS because I was out at work. Um, and I was watching uh, Ed Harris's, uh, oh, wow. yeah, and somebody asked him the same question, what do you feel about auditioning? And he said, I love auditioning, but you're talking to someone, I'm paraphrasing, but you're talking to someone who's very, you know, is, has a lot of experience and is successful, and so, you know, that's a whole different animal. But when I was auditioning to begin with, the thing that tripped me up all the time was I realized that I wanted something from the audition. I realized that if, if I get this part, I can impress this girl. If I get this part, I can pay for this apartment. And I just stopped and said, I'm going to do a three minute play because the only thing you don't get to do as a working actor is act mm -hmm. because you're doing so many other things. And my brain exploded. And um, it really struck me. He said, just go in and do a three minute play. And if they like you, they like you. And if they don't, they're gonna give it to someone else anyway because th this is what you do. The next day, I went in and I booked my first job ever. Really? Yeah, because of that, yep. Did you have any of those disastrous auditions or were you pretty oh lucky? Oh my God, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I actually was really lucky though. I, I asked, to, I went around um, New York City and I, I went to a bunch of casting people and instead of saying, hey, I'm an actor, if you ever need me, I said, do you need a reader? And Meg Simon at Warner Brothers in New York uh, called back and said, yeah, I'll take you as a reader. And that was incredible to sit there and be the reader for all these other actors. Meg, as soon as people would leave, and not in a negative way, she would just say, you know, these are the things we were looking for and these are the things that weren't really attained and these are the things that unfortunately for that person, they're just too tall because he doesn't know that the lead actress is small. And like, it was just, amazing mm. how much insight she gave and how much care she gave to me and I'll never forget it. Wow. Um, we had a question from Christopher C. Uh, Don't hey. speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, want to know, although many consider The Office your big break, what do you think of as your big milestone or transitional moment of your career? Well, that's really interesting. I mean, for sure, career-wise, there's no question. I mean, you know, the, the office was a lottery ticket. And, and so I have a hard time when people say, you know, my daughter or my son wants to get into acting, any advice? And I say like, don't listen to me. I mean, I, I literally won a lottery ticket. So there's no advice there because it was such a shot out of a cannon moment and nobody really knew what happened. And I think the only advice there is be prepared for anything. You know, you never know which one's gonna hit or which one's not. But the big thing for me was what do you fall in love with? And so, I do look back on that brief interviews thing at college because after I left school, it had stayed with me so much that uh, it was the first thing I directed and the first thing I wrote. Um, and it was because I was so impacted that I felt like I needed to let other people have that experience, however small the group of people <laughs> that would see it was. And so when I, I remember I went to the, um, the agent of David Foster Wallace and I said, I'd like to buy the rights to this to do as a movie. And she said, how much money do you have? And I called my manager and I said, how much was that pilot check? And to the cent, I just gave my entire pilot check to her and said, this is all I've got, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it back for you, I promise. And so it was one of those things where I think brief interviews to me was the breakthrough of falling in love with the idea of doing it. And then the office was obviously the, the idea of uh, the business break. So you bought the rights to brief interviews like early on in the office? Oh yeah, I was still waiting tables. So after I did the pilot, I went back to New York and waited tables because I was, I was like, you never know, this for sure won't go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had that money and I was so excited about it, but I just thought, I had this weird thing where, so I named my production company that I have now Sunday Night. And the reason why I named it Sunday Night was because all my friends in New York, when we all decided to move to New York, we were writers or directors and actors. And like I said, the only thing you don't get to do is the thing you love. So we were all assistants and waiters and I worked like seven jobs and so we would all meet on Sunday night and that was our time to talk about movies and plays and books and albums and it was the most amazing stuff. And at those tables, we would, you know, bang a table and say, you know, if we ever got the chance, this is what we do with that chance. And it's kind of the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. I mm -hmm. think people ask me now, you know, with all the stuff you're doing, are you running away from gym? And I said, absolutely not. It's the exact opposite. The idea of gym was such an opportunity, I genuinely didn't feel I deserved it. And so I had to go out and if these guys had gotten the chance that I had, 
they'd be doing, they'd be putting their money where their mouth is, and so I got to do that. So I, you know, went out and directed the hollers. I did my first play. I did 13 hours, and then I did the Quiet Place, and it was just this thing of. I made a promise to some younger spiritual self of mine that if I ever get the shot, do everything you can with it and don't just sit back and, and feel like you deserve it. So that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and during your time on The Office, you started doing movies. Mm -hmm. um, you did a movie that uh, I don't know, I don't even remember it coming out, but it has gone on to become like a huge favorite of everyone, Smiley Face. Oh my God, yes. 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 People love that movie. Or maybe not, no one reacted. Yeah, no one but. reacted. <laughs> But, yeah. <laughs> but whenever I bring it up, I feel like I love this, that movie. Yeah. I mean, Anna Faris is a genius, always has been. And the director was incredible. And the, the story of it, I was never a big pot smoker. So I loved this <laughs> idea of pretending to be in this crazy pot smoking uh, odyssey. And it was. Mm -hmm. And I got to play her very weird friend that secretly was in love with her and was super bizarre and weird. It's such a great movie. Um, and I think it's actually free on YouTube, so you have no excuse. Go check it out. Um, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, you'll get residuals from YouTube. Um, but, uh, but you were also doing like studio movies. You, worked with, you got to work with Robin Williams in yeah. License to Wed. I yep. can't even imagine what that's like. It, it was totally surreal. So I don't think I've ever told this story. I had the weirdest dream in college. So he, I was the biggest Robin Williams fan because he was somebody who was extremely funny, but also when you come from Boston, I think we all have like Goodwill Hunting tattooed to our backs. <laughs> like the entire poster is on my back. Um, and so that movie was extremely uh, transformative and insp inspiring. And I had this weird dream in college. I can't believe I'm saying this is definitely being recorded. But I had this weird dream that met Robin Williams and we were weirdly walking through the woods near my house where I grew up and he was just really nice and we were talking about stuff and not even acting or whatever. And then he was like, oh yeah, so I'm just gonna head home. And I was like, all right, whatever. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I got to meet Robin Williams in my dreams. <laughs> and then I did the movie with him and I told him that story. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I was there. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> he was the most amazing, sweetest, kindest, nicest, mm -hmm. all the things that you could want. And he also taught me something that I'll never forget and actually try to practice every day. He also said, we were at craft service, which by the way, it makes me laugh. So we were at craft service one day and someone had dropped something and it sounded like a gunshot. Oh, and he was like, putting cream cheese on a bagel or something, and somebody dropped something. And this is how good he was. He was so fast that we were talking about like a news article in the paper, and somebody went, bam, and he went <laughs> into the craft service table. And it was like, that is, oh, wow. I don't even think I heard it by the time yeah. you reacted. Oh, it was so amazing. But it was also at that craft service table when we were talking, he said, Listen, I, he had, I think he had seen some of The Office or something, and he said, you know, um, I think you're great, and I think one day you'll be number one on the call sheet, and the only thing I would tell you is always respect what that means. Don't ever take that as a vanity thing. Always remember it's actually a responsibility and a responsibility you have to every single person on set. So he said, for instance, if it's hot and the AC breaks, you don't get to say the AC is broken and that you're hot because as soon as you say you're hot, everybody's hot. Mm -hmm. And then it was just this thing where I, would, I just thought how incredible that he had reached a pinnacle in his life and in his career where he had every right to just sit back and do whatever he wanted and instead he was just pushing to make sure there was more and more and more uh, that he could give to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Michael. Um, wants to know if you can talk about the transition from TV to film, but specifically evolving from nice guy to action star. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you could be a nice guy action star. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, no, it was one of those things, again, I try to do things that feel really organic to me. You know, um, A Quiet Place is certainly one of those things where never thought I'd do a horror movie, never watched horror movies as a kid. What? And yeah, never was terrified. I mean, it was just such a scaredy cat. And then the idea of it, which I could talk about later, but with the office and the whole thing, it was, it was this thing that I wanted to do things that challenged me and I wanted things to organically come around. And to be really honest with you, um, I remember someone saying to me, oh man, when that show ends, just wait, the phone's gonna ring off the hook. 
And the real truth is, is it, it didn't. It was like this weird thing where I think people wanted to sort of put you in, you know, a glass case and be like, you were Jim from The Office and that was an amazing run. And I remember that really frustrated me, not because of Jim, but because as artists, I think we always want to try new things and challenge ourselves and, and fail. Actually, the, that school I told you about, um, NTI, their, their slogan is risk, fail, and fail again. And I think that that's brilliant. You know, that's what I wanted to do. So I got frustrated by that. And so it wasn't about trying to become an action star. This script... Uh, 13 Hours came to me, and I come from a huge military family, and I'd always wanted to do something in the military. I have 11 aunts and uncles and cousins that have served or are currently serving still, and so I wanted to not honor them or anything like that, because how can you honor that commitment? But I, I wanted to be a part of something that told a story of the heroism that I know they go through every day. And so I really, really, really wanted that part, and I really dedicated myself to it. And it was one of those things where they had had two stars that they already knew that they were going to cast, so I was told. But um, Denise, the casting director, who's unbelievable, asked that I come in specifically, and she said, yes, that they're all saying that these two people have been cast, um, but I think you'd be great for it. And she, again, I just did that Ed Harris thing. I was like, great, I got three minutes to do this, and if nothing else, I got to play a military guy for three minutes. And they were great scenes, and it was the phone call at the end of the movie, if you've seen it, and it was something else which was really great to do in an audition room. It was really scary. And um, when I got the part, I think everybody, you know, when, when the movie came out, everybody was like, oh, I see you're trying to transition into action guy. And I said, no, that was actually one of the most personal roles I've played in a long time because I got to sort of embody my cousins and my aunts and my uncles that I get to see all the time and, uh, you know, are my actual day-to-day -day heroes. So that's, that's sort of how it happened organically. And then yeah, I think when you take your shirt off in a movie and people go, oh, <laughs> okay. Because I remember every audition being like, I, I totally can get worked out. I, 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 and they're like, <laughs> he can't get worked out. <laughs> and then as soon as you do it, they're like, he can get worked out. Okay, let's try some other parts. He can do it. And I was like, I'm, it's just a gym membership. I can, <laughs> I think we can all do it. It's like, not that, no, you can't. <laughs> And did 13 Hours sort of lead directly to Jack Ryan? Because it's the same yep, producers, exactly, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. It was the same producers, and it was Paramount, and they had seen a screening of 13 Hours while they were uh, developing the show. I knew nothing about the show. I just signed on to my first play. Again, it was one of those things I wanted to keep trying new things. And the play was unbelievable. I got to work with um, the most amazing actors. I worked with Hank Azaria and Claire Danes and... Um, also, the director was Tommy Kale, who had directed a very small play called Hamilton. And um, <laughs> it was just perfect. So I was in this sort of zone with that. And while I was rehearsing that uh, play, they called and said, you know, there's this, they're going to redo Jack Ryan. And I, I, I love the character, but I didn't know what I would bring to it. And then they said, it's going to be long form television. And I thought, well, that's the answer. If you mm -hmm. can actually investigate a character, if you can actually live with this character on screen, and see you know, what he's like alone and what makes him scared and all these things. Because it's hard to do a heroic story in two hours because you gotta kinda just get to a fist fight with the bad guy and then sort of get to the end, you know? And in this, you actually get to live with them and, and, and that was my big hook. I'm trying to think, but um, Harrison Ford, Alec Baldwin, Chris what? Pine, Ben Affleck, they've all played Jack Ryan. What are you talking about? Am I about? missing any? <laughs> Am I not the first one? <laughs> all right, can we cut the tape? This is insane. Um, yes. Um, and you know some of these people. Did you, I don't know, I don't want to say ask for advice, but sort of discuss I didn't ask for any advice. No, I, I, I know Ben, I know Chris, but I, I know Alec really well. And Alec uh, and I have had so much fun from It's Complicated to I wrote these really goofy Boston Red Sox versus Yankees commercials that he did with me. And um, I wrote it with this amazing guy, Charlie Grandy, and, and Alec decided to do it. I couldn't believe he signed on. I don't know why. <laughs> But they were the most fun I've had in a long, long time. And, and so I wrote to him and I just said, hey, so I'm going to be playing Jack Ryan. And he wrote back something hilarious and sort of uh, basically yelled at me and was like, I'm still better than you in this role. <laughs> and I was like, I haven't shot it yet. But yes, I'm sure you're right. Um, and no, he was just so nice. He just yeah. said, good luck with it. And, and I hope it goes great for you. It was so yeah. incredibly kind. Yeah. I mean, it is such its own animal. I love mm -hmm. that we get to spend more time with this character. Mm. The, the, the balance of action, but then also character development is really great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's one of those characters that I always was drawn to as a kid because 
I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know, maybe I was just like a super realist kid, but I knew I could never be Batman or Superman or any of those people. But there was something about Jack Ryan that, yeah, it's just a guy who uses his brain and his instincts and he can get stuff done and one person can change the world. And I remember always being really inspired by that, that idea that if you stand up for what you believe and there is a battleground of what's right and wrong. And sometimes it's really hard and the lines are blurry, but you have to fight for what's right. Uh, forgive me for not knowing, is there a season two already greenlit? Or? We are shooting it right now. You're kidding. Yes. Oh, wow. Yep. And I, uh, I think we have, we have uh, like two or three more weeks of shooting and then we're done. Is that an exhausting role? I mean, and also just doing a series. I, <laughs> I know it's, you know, yeah, more it's, limited. But. It is. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, anytime you're the, the, your character's name is the show <laughs> and you're doing a lot more work. Um, but it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's a totally different experience and, um, you know, coming from all the stuff that I've been writing and directing and producing, it's, you know, I have nothing to do with this show as far as creative, you know, push of it. This is all seen through the eyes of these showrunners. And so it's kind of nice to just check in as the actor yeah. for that one. So it's good. Uh, I want to talk about some of the directors you've worked with because you were in George Clooney's Leatherheads. Mm -hmm. um, that was still during The Office. Oh, yeah. As I believe. Um, you worked with Sam Mendes. Yep. On still in The Office. Yep. <laughs> wow. I know Bill Condon has cast you a couple times. Bill Kinsey. did, yeah, in Kinsey, and then I had a tiny role in Dreamgirls. I'd yeah. do anything Bill called for, but Bill was one of those people that um, he cast me in Kinsey and totally one of those nightmare moments where I was doing the lines with Liam Neeson, as you do, <laughs> in the makeup trailer, and Liam Neeson was so nice, and we were doing these lines, and I played this character who basically couldn't, I still believe that babies came out of like women's right. navels and things like that. Like it was the idea of where America was and their understanding of sex. And we were doing the lines and it was great. We were laughing and we talked about the Simpsons. And even back then I was like trying to get stuff made, not for me, but for him. He was like, I love the Simpsons so much. And I said, I'm sure you could get on the Simpsons. And he was like, you think I could? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, He's like, in what capacity? And I said, as groundkeeper Willie's brother. <laughs> yes. Like, definitely come back as like a cool, and so I, I think later he was on The Simpsons having nothing to do with our conversation. But anyway, it was like such a fun environment in the trailer. And then I got on set, and they go to my coverage, and it was just like, no. I got nothing. I don't even know what these words are. I don't know what I'm talking about. And, I don't, and it was really terrifying, because it was one of my first jobs. <laughs> I'll never forget. Liam Neeson leans over the desk, the scene as he's behind the desk, and he leans over and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know, I'm so sorry. And he was like, what are you doing? I was so perfect in the trailer, just do that. And I was like, yeah, I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> but it kind of was exactly what I needed to hear and what he was inviting me to do is go yeah. back to sort of that, just talking about The Simpsons. And it really did unlock it and, and had a lot of fun. I still have the, piece of paper because Bill Condon rewrote the scene, which I thought was definitely because I was terrible. Um, and he rewrote the scene with a pencil on the back of the sides and I still, I still have that. Mm. Yeah. And you got to work with Nancy Myers more than once? Yeah. That's really cool. That's really fun. Yeah, I mean, Nancy's, Nancy's amazing. I mean, it's complicated for me. I don't even know how much I worked with Nancy. It was more like I did a part in these amazing movies. Uh, you know, the first one I did with her was really a small part, but it was fun. And then it's complicated. I, I mean, when you step on set with Meryl Streep, period, and then Alec Baldwin also, you're just like, all right, I, this is it. I, I should be retiring now. This is, <laughs> this is it. I win. And it was just so much fun. Uh, the first time I met Meryl, I was opening the door. At, I was her son-in-law, and I was opening the door to bring her into our apartment. And I don't know why I did this, but I said uh, she would listen to Nancy's direction, and we were about to rehearse, and I said, just so you know, when I, uh, I open this door, I'm gonna be shirtless. And Meryl, without hesitation, goes, then I think you need to do some push-ups. <laughs> and I was like, nice. I was it was just so good. Like yeah. the fact that she took the piss out of me that fast yeah. was amazing. And we had a great relationship. It was really fun. It was great. And then Alec was insane. When we did this bathroom scene that's in the movie, none of that was happening. It was sort of, they were smoking and I walk in and she walks in and it was like an amazing physical comedy bit. And then if you watch the movie, you can see again, Captain Professional starts to break. But Alec Baldwin, Nancy was like, you know, I had improv a couple lines. She always let me improv, which I don't know why. And, and I was improv and she said, that's great, John, it's really funny. And then Alec, you could tell was like, well, I'm gonna improv because 
I'm also funny, so watch this. <laughs> and he grabbed the back of my head and he was like, um, um, uh, he's like, here, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this, just do it. And he turns the joint around and his sh I didn't know what a shotgun was and he goes, I'm gonna shotgun you. And I was like, what? And so in the movie, you see me going, <laughs> like, and that is John Krasinski being manhandled by Alec Baldwin. That is not a character choice. He is very strong. Very strong. And it's the reason why when we did that Boston Red Sox New York Yankees thing, I wrote, in the, I wrote a line in them that says, you have the hands of a plumber. It's just so strong. I couldn't get away. So basically, he actually blew smoke in my mouth. I was not accepting of it. Yeah. And when you worked with George Clooney, it was, I think, the year before you shot Brief Interviews with Hideous Man. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, were you sort of, that's in many ways the path people want to emulate. He's an actor who yeah. was directing and directing himself, no less. Yeah, that was, that was a crazy experience because, again, I just worked with uh, Robin. And I, I think if I hadn't worked with Robin, I would have lost my mind on, <laughs> on Leatherheads. Truly, though, because I was so new to the whole thing, I was kind of losing my mind about how the office had just sort of taken on, and it's a lot. I, I, you know, there's no two ways about it. I don't know a lot of people who are just like, yeah, your show's a huge hit, like, be totally cool with it. It's, it's a court, sort of an adjustment, you know, and I was, I'm bizarrely, probably less so, but I was kind of a really shy person at the time. And so when I got on Leatherheads, and there's Renee, and there's George, I, I was sort of freaking out, and George was so amazing from the get-go, and he has remained one of my dearest friends and mentors because of that, because he let me in on the process. He let me in on, uh, he was, uh, I was a confidant, he was a confidant. We used to talk about the script and things that he was gonna change. I think in the first week he started bringing me to dinner almost every night and was saying, this is what we're gonna shoot and this is how we're gonna do it. And it was just a crash course in, in all that is, is him. And he's the most, Obviously, talented guy, but as a person, he's so incredibly warm and so um, inclusive. And so, you know, we went on, we've gone on to stay friends. And he's the guy who I'll shoot an email to before you go direct or when you are writing a script or something. You just you just reach out to him because he's that guy who has just a ton of people who love him, and he wants to give that love back. Mm -hmm. And when you decided to make, well, I guess you decided early on to make brief interviews with hideous men. Um, this is, I mean, David Foster Wallace is kind of impossible to adapt, it would seem, or very challenging. Well, it's, challenging. it's one of, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't do Infinite Jest ever. That <laughs> took me like six years and 84 bottles of Advil to get through, but um, <laughs> I made it. Um, he's the most, uh, I, I think he, he has to go down as one of the most important writers we've ever had. I think there are, there are thoughts and certainly turn of phrase and, and words that he puts in your head that will never come out, thank God, because he just, he, he was a transformative person. Luckily, Brief Interviews is, if anybody hasn't read David Foster Wallace, I always say that Brief Interviews is a crash, it's a mm -hmm. great end to it, because they are just interviews with guys. You'll get to know his language. There are other essays in the book that are really funny and well-written and painful and dark and all these things, but it was, it was kind of a nice introduction to him. And because it was laid out, almost like scenes, I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I'll just do the connective tissue and, and connect them all. And my whole plan there was pretty simple. I had never directed, so I just thought, I'll just throw this in the wind and see what happens and get a really good DP who happens to be the president of our academy right now, which is John <laughs> Bailey, and, um, and uh, get my favorite actors. I remember I went through a list of everybody who had blown me away in New York. So when I was waiting tables, I would always run and see plays and go to TKTS and get tickets and... So I, I just got, you know, Bobby Cannavale, I got Ben Shankman, I got all these people that I'd seen on stage rip my heart and face off, and, and I just thought, I'll, I'll ask them if they want to do this thing. And they were all just small monologues. Yeah. And so you could come in for a day, do a monologue, and leave. And so a lot of people did it, which was great. Did you find the experience rewarding? Because this was your first, obviously you went on to do it again. Yeah, I had a blast. And I, and I was, but it, again, it was one of those things where I, I try to stay open to all these moments. And when I finished, I remember John Bailey and I were talking and I said, wow, that was amazing. And he said, it really was. Um, that could have gone horribly wrong. And I said, what do you mean? And he was the first person who just put my perspective back to day one and said, let's just walk through this experience and see where you got really lucky and where you, the next time you don't, you should plan to not be lucky. You should plan to be right and plan to be prepared. And it was amazing because there were so many moments where you know, we'd lose a location. And when you're 26 years old and 
have never directed before, you're like, ah, if we lose that location, we just go over here. And he was like, that's not usually how it works. <laughs> but it sort of worked out. It was a, it was a pretty cool existence. And, and it, it, it was huge for me as a director to have him look back and show me all the things that I can prepare more for. And I just started building from there. Did you actually have auditions for that movie, or did you, you said you just sort of cast people that you admired? No, we had some auditions for sure for some of the smaller roles. Um, you know, we had like Michael Cerveris come in and he did a part, and Chris Messina did a part, and all these different things. Um, we had some auditions for for the roles, but um, no, for the most part, it was kind of just who I had been blown away by. Mm -hmm. What's it like for you to be on the other side of the audition table? Well, uh, nothing but pure empathy. I mean, yeah. you know exactly what is happening. And so I have never, I never look for a knockout performance. I always look for someone who gets it. Mm. So to me, you can mess up nearly every line. You can, um, you can make big, bold choices, but I know, or I should say, I, I, I think I know what I feel is that you're onto something and that you're in our, you're in our sandbox and you can play with us. And you're in this target, which has to be small, but if you can just stay within these four borders of our sandbox, we can do something really fun. And that's, that's the best part about being an actor. You know, one of the best parts about being an actor that directs is you know not to look for all these other stupid things. You just go for, like, is it you? Do you, do you have the heart of this character? And let's do it. And then in 2012, you co-wrote and starred in uh, Promised Land, yes. directed by Gus Van Sant, um, with Matt Damon. Mm -hmm. Did you show him your back tattoo? That's of, what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. So here we go. Another story of like, oh my god, it just sounds like I'm a fanboy. Like everywhere I go, <laughs> it's kind of what I am. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was amazing. Matt was doing, <laughs> he was doing adjustment bureau with my wife, and I had never met him before. And I think I've told this story before, but the first day I met Matt Damon, which I had sort of prepared in my head, I wasn't walking through the woods with him or anything, but <laughs> I, uh, I, I had definitely felt that, you know, you know, I'd love to talk to him about writing and Boston and all the things. We seemed similar. And I remember Emily saying, we're shooting at 30 Rock today at the top. You should come because we had just started dating. We were, I think we had just started dating. Yeah, I think it was just before we got engaged or something. And so... We, uh, she said, come to 30 Rock, the view's amazing. I said, great. And she goes, come after 4 p.m. And I was like, that's weird. You've never like given me a time to show up. And I thought, oh, fine, whatever. Maybe they're doing stunt work or something. So I show up at 4, and I'm being led up all these stairs to get up there, and elevators and stairs. And every couple of seconds, you know, they're like, rolling, rolling, and we stop. And then we get to the top, and they sort of blow through, like, whatever, the pigeon door or something. And... They're like, rolling, rolling! And somebody grabbed me and threw me into the producer's tent, which is the, all blacked out. And my face went right up against the screen, right in time to see Matt being like, <laughs> with my wife. And one of the producers goes, is that why you came today? And I went, what? <laughs> and he was like, totally get it, man. Protect your girl. And I was like, what? This is so weird. And then I went outside, and my first meeting with Matt Damon is my wife comes up to me with like pink all around her mouth, and I was like, that's great. And then he comes up and he goes, hey man, I was just totally tonguing your girl. And I went, cool man, thanks. And he goes, oh my God, why did I just say that? He was like, I was trying to make a joke. I'm the worst. And he walked off, and that was my first meeting. <laughs> that was my first meeting with Matt, yeah. What was I thinking? And from there, a partnership was born? Yeah, we yeah. like fought in the street for like an hour, and then <laughs> it was fine. No, it was. it was. It was very quick. Matt and I, you know, I was actually right. I thought we'd have similar sensibilities, but I didn't realize that he'd become such an unbelievable friend. And, and um, you know, again, I, I just, I'm one of those people who wants to learn every single day, every single second, and, and there's so much I can be doing better in per personal life and career. And so he's one of those guys who was just so much fun to talk mm -hmm. to. And, then one day we were at dinner, um, and it was, I remember it was a loud restaurant, and he just said, um, do you write? And I said, I, yeah, I mean, I, I do, but um, yeah, and I was so unconfident with it. And he said, well, do you have anything right now? And I said, yeah, I've got this idea. Um, it's about these two brothers. One of the brothers uh, gets sick and knows he's going to die, so he asked his brother to take care of his son. And it was Manchester by the Sea. And so I had this idea, and Matt was going to direct it, and we were going to do it together. And then when we were talking, I told him about this other idea of, of Promised Land, and that sort of started to take a faster track. Mm -hmm. And so he said, uh, because I hadn't started writing Manchester by the Sea, I just had the story. And we gave it to Kenny Lonergan, and I think it was like two or three years later, Kenny delivered a script. We weren't even sure he was going to deliver a script. 
And then it came in and it is the movie that, you know, yeah. and it's and it's all Kenny. People always say, you know, like, are you so bummed that you didn't get to do that? And I was like, no way, man. You're missing the whole point of what we're doing if, if I was bummed. This is, this is a guy who had a specific voice on a story that was meant so much to me, but I never would have gone down that road with it. It would have been a totally different movie, so thank goodness he, he did it the way he did. And then Casey Affleck played the part that Matt was going to play, and I'm pretty sure Matt would say the same thing, otherwise he's a jerk. But, um, <laughs> no, but like you, you get Casey Affleck to do that role, and that movie becomes what it is. Yeah. And with uh, The Haulers, which mm -hmm. was at 2014, 2015, I think? I am terrible with dates. My, yeah, me too. All I know is like right after The Office ended. I, uh, oh, really? I, again, there was that thing of like, I didn't know what I was going to do next. And then, you know, the whole phone call thing wasn't really what it turned out to be. And I was auditioning and doing these things, but it just wasn't really... I, it, and I get it. There's like a moment where everybody just says like, we should let, you know... I, I don't want to cast Jim from The Office to be Jim from The Office. And that's when I was like, I think I can do other things. And so I started writing. And so um, I didn't write the hollers, but I started writing some other stuff. And we were talking about Promised Land and all these things. And then Jim Strauss uh, had asked me to be the actor in this movie, The Hollers, like years earlier. And he was going to direct it. And he wanted Margot Martindale to do it. And I just said, absolutely. It was this. It, 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 I come from an incredibly loving, close knit family. And this family is a disaster. And yet at the end of the. At the end of the script, I just said, that's my family. There was something so universal about it. Even though their specific situation was different, it was my family and the idea for me of family and what love is and what reliance and what the, the beautiful idea of falling in love with your mom and, and all that stuff was, was important to me. So <clears throat> Jim actually went off to direct something else. And I said, I'll, I'll direct it. And we just made the movie down in Jackson, Mississippi. I mean, you had amazing actors in brief interviews, mm -hmm. but I mean, you're directing Marco Martindale, Richard Jenkins, um, and you're playing opposite them. Yeah. I mean, this is very different from your first experience. Yeah. Was it hard to... But now I was a jackass, so I was like, yeah. I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. Um, it was amazing. We went down there, and you know, again, it's one of those things where when you're on the other side, you remember very clearly that people are coming down to Jackson, Mississippi for no money and they're leaving their families. And so you need to make this a summer camp experience. You need to make this something that we'll always remember. And so that's what I said to them. I said, listen, I'm just, I just want to make it special for you. And we had a table read and I remember Richard Jenkins coming up to me. It was because we had never met, but I, we had really? almost bumped into each other a whole bunch of times. And he's one of my favorite actors, period. And I remember he came up to me and I said, thank you so much for being in this. And, you know, it's going to be this, this. And I was about to pitch him and he said, here's the deal. <laughs> I've done a lot of these, okay? I've done a lot of these movies and I've traveled and done the whole thing. Just don't make it shit. Just don't make this one that sucks. And I go, I can promise you that that won't happen. And he was like, great. And then on day three of shooting or something, I'll never forget, we called rap on the day. And he came up to me and he just looked at me and he went, all right. Okay, cool. Wow. I love it. And he walked away. And I could tell that he was feeling the, the vibe of yeah. the movie and that we were into something. And it turned out to be, he rapped like, he was supposed to only be there for, you know, two weeks and was actually ended up being there for five weeks or something. And I thought I was ruining his life. And turns out he was having <clears throat> the greatest time mm -hmm. ever. So I, I loved that experience. That was a really good Richard Jenkins. <clears throat> Thank by you. By the way. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> we're going to watch the tape. I think people are going to be like, it's not great. <laughs> Uh, which brings us to A Quiet Place. Mm -hmm. um, how did this project find its way to you? Because I've heard different stories. I'm yeah. really curious. Um, <laughs> it's already lore? This well, yeah. It's I only mean, been a year, for God's sake. God. I heard this weird story, and we can cut this out if I'm like... Uh, that like Emily read it you guys have kind of read it at the same time but separately no so what happened okay. was I was uh, about to start Jack Ryan the first season we were doing prep for it and Platinum Dunes was the producers on it and uh, Drew Form and Brad Fuller who are the producers on this movie um, while we were talking about Jack Ryan they said hey we have this genre script would you ever play the lead in this movie and I said no I, I don't watch genre I can't do genre it freaks me out and they said, it's a pretty good premise. And I said, what's the premise? And they said, it's about a family that can't talk and you have to figure out why. And I remember being like, damn it. <laughs> That's the best one-liner ever. And so yeah. I read it. And we had just had our second daughter. She was three weeks old. And I was actually holding a three-week-old while reading a story about a family who had to keep their kids quiet and do whatever it, it, it 
they could to protect them. And I went to some other place, have never had this experience in my career. I visualized the movie from top to bottom <clears throat> within minutes of finishing the script. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the script. I thought if I could rewrite this using the experience that I'm going through right now, which is, you know, the idea they had written was perfect. The idea mm -hmm. was perfect and there were so many great elements, but, but I knew I needed to rewrite the whole thing in order to make it what I wanted it to be, which was a love letter to my kids. I know that sounds crazy when you look at the poster, but I, I thought I can actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I just thought, uh, this is everything I want to say about being a dad, which is, you know, as, as much beauty and, and uh, existential change that you go through with children, there's always that thing, that's, there's always that fear that you won't be there when you need to be there. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I, I, I got to write this for these two little girls. And so I wrote the script only about that. I just, <clears throat> and I had no idea what I was doing because I had never seen genre movies. Of course, I went through like a crash course. So for a year, I watched oh, only yeah. horror movies. Yeah, Oh No is right. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure people at like the NSA are like, there is a very dark dude. It's just like every night is like the scariest, weirdest movie. Um, my iTunes list is, is terrifying. Um, but I, I, I didn't know what to do with genre. And it's funny because it does bring it back to the office, which is I remember Greg Daniels said to me one day on set, he said, your job is not to say these lines funny. Your job is just to say these lines. And if people think it's funny, that's up to them. And if people think your relationship with Pam is emotional, then that's up to them too. But you're just a regular person. I thought that's, it's advice that seems so simple, but it has completely changed my outlook on a lot of the creative stuff I'm doing. Because I looked, I wouldn't have done A Quiet Place if it wasn't for Greg. And the reason why is because if I went into that movie saying I was gonna make a movie that would scare the shit out of you, it would have sucked. I, I wouldn't know what I was doing because it's not what I am. And so I said, I'm going to write this family drama. And if I do my job right and you love this family, then it will be 10 times scarier because you care about them. Mm -hmm. It won't be scary because I have stuff pop out at you. It'll be scary because you don't want anything to happen to them. And that's how I wrote it. I wrote a family drama that was Trojan horsed as a genre film. And do you, since you spent that whole crash course year watching genre films, mm -hmm. do you sort of like them now? I or? love them. Oh, really? Well, the first thing you realize when, you know, I hadn't watched horror movies, you know, I, I, I grew up, you know, by the time, like, I was watching horror movies, it was probably 91 or something. And so the first one was, like, Nightmare on Elm Street. And I was like, <laughs> nope, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> no. Obviously, I'm a dreams guy, so I don't need him visiting my dreams. I want to walk in the woods with a Robin Williams, not Freddy. <laughs> um, and so I just bailed on it. And what you realize is, since then, uh, I just realized how ignorant I was. Because genre films right now, I think, are some of the most unbelievable filmmaking you can get. Mm -hmm. From the writing to the, to the way it's shot and then the directing. So, you know, you just take a look at the last five years. For me, it was like, Get Out is astounding. And The Witch is terrifying and astounding. And then you look at a movie like Let the Right One In. The original Let the Right One In is one of the best love stories I've ever seen. It's just so much quality and, and beautiful, um, delicate storytelling. And so uh, that's what I fell in love with. I mean, I think the scariest movie of all time is The Exorcist. Oh yeah. And a lot of that is because you care about exactly. these characters. For sure, yeah. and it's also terrifying. It is utterly terrifying. <laughs> and her head spins around also. So that, <laughs> that's also just Spoiler straight alert. up terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Had you seen that before? Did you go back and watch it for this? I or? had seen like, like snippets of it. Yeah. And yeah, I did watch it for this and, and, and you know, I watched everything. But for me, it wasn't about the scary movies uh, like that. To me, I wanted A Quiet Place to feel more like a throwback. I wanted mm. it to feel like the, one of those movies that, I remember as a kid, there was a certain brand of movie that as soon as it started, you were like, I'm gonna love this. <laughs> Whether it was like Goonies or, you know, obviously all of Spielberg stuff, you just knew, you just knew that there was something in there. It's why I shot on film. I thought there was something nostalgic about that first moment where you see a film image rather than a digital image. And I know they're very similar, but there's something about it. And so for me, the, the whole idea was I wanted this to feel like a throwback. So I, I just kept watching Jaws and Alien and Rosemary's Baby and all of Hitchcock stuff. And so that's sort of what this movie was born out of. And then from a visual standpoint, Everybody kept asking me, you know, oh, so you're watching silent films? And I said, well, this movie isn't a silent film, actually. It's, it's just a movie where you can't speak. And so I, yes, I watched all that silent film stuff, but more modern take on things was what was really interesting to me to see, you know, in the modern day with lenses and cameras and stuff, what people were doing. And so it was There Will Be Blood, um, Paul's movie is, oh, wow. 
I think it's one of the best movies I'll ever see in my life. And those first whatever 12 minutes where no one speaks, he, he does it so brilliantly. And then No Country for Old Men, you know, mm -hmm. when you see Josh, that entire run, I mean, just the idea of landscapes and these characters who don't say anything, but you know exactly what's going on. And so those were the, those were the touchstones visually for us. Now that you say Jaws, it seems like, I'm like, of course. Yeah, that very... was bizarrely Emily and I's favorite movie when we started dating. Really? Which again, sounds like we're like, what kind of story is that? Like, <laughs> what movies you guys watch to fall in love? And we're like, Jaws. <laughs> um, we watched Jaws like eight times in the first three weeks of You're dating. kidding. I don't even know what that's about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it's about, but it was it was definitely the touchstone for this movie. I, I there's there's so much of you know what Spielberg did so incredibly well uh, that I wanted to to take a run at in this. Uh, I want to talk about casting the film because you know there's the old adage about like never work with animals or children, right. and you have this amazing young cast um, and animals. Yeah, that's right. There's <laughs> animals. <too. laughs> Technically, yeah. Um, Millicent Simmons, who I had just seen in Wonderstruck mm -hmm. when I found out she was cast in this, who actually is deaf, mm -hmm. um, was it important to you to cast a hearing impaired actress? It was non-negotiable. So the first thing I said to Paramount was, and I was still, you know, with all due respect, I hadn't directed a studio movie. I was mm -hmm. certainly not, it wasn't going great for me as a director on this movie until I sort of pitched them my ideas and my script. And once they saw that I had a vision, it was fine. But I understand the system and I understand that I'm not the first person that you're like, yeah, go direct a studio horror movie that you've <laughs> never done before. That's perfect. But the first thing I said was I, I, I have to have a deaf actress in the role. It's non-negotiable for me, not only because yes, the performance will be so much more authentic, but because I needed a guide. I needed a guide to lead me through this world. You know, what is it like to be the only deaf person in your family? Which is what our situation was. What is it like? Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel empowered? Do you feel all these things? So I, I went on this hunt for a deaf actress and, and the uh, casting director that we had, Laura Rosenthal, the, really, the reason why I called her is she had just cast Wonderstruck. So I said, I imagine you saw a whole lot of deaf actresses. And she said, I did, but the only person you need to see is Millie. And I said, great, but at the same time, I was also like, I don't want it to be my first person that, that anybody told me about. I'd, you know, I should do my due diligence. Yeah. And so I, I watched a lot of stuff. And then I met her and the, there are people that you'll work with in your career that you'll say that was one of the most important experiences. Working with her was one of the most important experiences of my life because Emily and I said it the same day driving home from set one day. We said, she's not from here. She's, she's a legit angel. She's from somewhere else. And th there's something about her that is so knowledgeable, so spiritual, so powerful and she just gets it. And so she's one of those people that you say you're just, you were lucky enough to spend any time with her. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really who she is. And then on top of her being a beautiful human being, she's a lights out actress. I mean, yeah, lights she's out. I just felt so silly some days. She was so nice to like, we were going through, you know, so in the movie, our, our two characters have this very troubled relationship. We used to be best friends. And then there's a lot of guilt and blame of, of who did what. And so it's this idea of, two people who really actually are the same person. She kind of is me uh, as far as our likes and instincts. And I wanted to sort of talk her through it. So it was no rehearsal. There was more of a lot more like psychoanalysis. Like we were talking about big things like family and stuff. And this scene where she walks across the bridge, um, she does this like tough warrior princess walk, which I love. <laughs> then I was telling her like, you know, and so you have this on your mind and this on your mind and this on your mind. And she's looking at me with the sweetest smile like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I was like, so, you know, so whatever you want. And it was sort of like, I could see in the back of her head, she was like, you're adorable. <laughs> and then the first take, she was just like, right out of the gates, just crushed the scene. And I was like, so I'm obsolete. I'm just going to stand back here. I'm just going to roll the camera and you do whatever you want to do. She was, um, she's a complete and total uh, pro. And, and Noah is, uh, you know, he's unbelievable. Yeah. And the thing is, you said it, is I've always been told, you know, don't work with kids. They, they never know their lines and they have these hours and you can't shoot with them and they're going to affect your schedule. And I had the exact opposite experience. Mm -hmm. I worked with the most professional actors I've worked with. I learned from them. They probably saved me time. It was, it was incredible. And they were just such good 
troopers and such good teammates and understood the bigger picture of what we were doing and how little time we had, how little money we had, and how much they could help if they gave it their all, and they gave it their all every single day. It's such a great ensemble. I mean, every role. Actually, my friend is uh, Leon Ressum. No way! But yes! And oh, he God, he was amazing. He's the guy who, um, the man, in, the old man in the woods yeah. who, yeah. He's also, if you guys are uh, Lebowski fans, he's right. the cop. Who the says, sheriff. Stay out of my beach community. Yes. <laughs> um, which I nerded out on him a lot about that. But no, Leon was so great, and he had just played, or was about to play. He was. He had just played King Lear. Yes. So we were looking. I was looking for a guy who looked like he had been living in the woods for a long time, and which is really hard mm -hmm. to tell. Again, it's hard to tell an actor like. You're so right for the part. Can you grow out your hair to like 12 inches and grow a beard in two days? Otherwise, you don't have the part. And. Um, he had just done Lear and he did this audition and the audition was just sort of going through someone narrating a very painful experience and how he dealt with oh, it. Oh wow. Yeah, I was wondering how you auditioned for a movie like this. Yeah. It's mostly silent. And, well with Millie it was, uh, I tried to find scenes again that were silent but tons of acting so I had her do the Kramer versus Kramer scene where the little boy with the ice cream and uh, things like that where it was, it was, there were parent scenes with kids where there was no talking. I got. I saw this movie a little before it premiered at South by Southwest. I'm not bragging. There's a point. That was a this. brag. Yeah. <laughs> that was a brag. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't know Leon was in it, mm -hmm. and it was one of those things where you're watching a movie and you're like, "Oh, there's my friend. Oh my God." Yeah, exactly. You know? And I was like, "Please stop, yes. Leon." I well, mean, one of the things that you'll see in the movie is he he doesn't have teeth, and it's one of those things where you can't cast an actor for this either. And he showed up on the first day, and and we were shooting that scene. And he said, uh, oh, before we roll, just quick thing, like, uh, I can take my teeth out. Is that something you want? And I went, uh, and he just went, does this look good? And I was like, yes. <laughs> That's going to be perfect for what we need. And he was like, okay, great. Just like, I, I can do either. And I was like, oh, cool. I can also juggle, but it's different. It's different, but yeah. I actually didn't know those weren't his teeth, and now you're blowing my mind. Blowing my mind, yeah. <laughs> And uh, casting Emily, I don't know if you cast her or you know how that even works or if maybe you were resistant to the idea. I was terrified of the mm. idea. And, and she cast herself basically. And what happened was... <laughs> this, this is the story I heard. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was I'd gotten, the, I'd gotten the script, I'd read it and I said I'm going to rewrite it and I'm going to star in it. And I started pitching her this whole, again, I don't know why, just in 30 minutes I knew the exact thing I wanted to do with the movie. And she said, no, you're not going to do that. And I said, I'm not. And she said, no, you're going to direct it. And I said, why? And she said, I've never seen you lit up like this. You have to take it all the way. You have to protect this movie in, uh, on all sides and bring it all the way. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. So she's the reason why I directed the movie. And then she was doing, uh, like I said, she had just had a baby. Uh, and she was doing a tiny indie movie called Mary Poppins. Oh, um, so good. So yeah. good. So, you know, it's, it's a tough to yeah. not have a big budget. And... Um, <laughs> So she was busy with all that stuff, and so while I was writing, I only wrote for her. I, I wrote the part only for her. But it got to this weird place, and I wasn't expecting it. And again, I tried to ha make everything organic as, or as uh, organic as it can be. And so I didn't want her to say no, because that would be an awkward dinner conversation. But I think I was more scared that she would say, yes, I'll do it for you. Mm. Um, because she's that type of person, and she knew it was a big moment in my career. She knew I was taking a big swing. and. Just, I think the thing, the reason why I didn't ask her was at the end of the day, I've sat next to her for the last, you know, 10 years while I've been there when she makes every single decision that she makes. And there is no one who's classier with better taste and more dedication to the project she does. And so the one thing I couldn't have is that the one time she did a movie just to do a movie was for her husband. So I didn't ask her. And then I was flying to Paramount to pitch them, you know, all my ideas but going into production. And she said, can I read that script? And I said, sure. And she had just recently, the week before, recommended a friend. And so I was sort of moving down the path with this friend of hers. And on the plane, she read it while I was watching, like, Ant-Man or something. <laughs> and, uh, which was great. And um, she turned, like, gray. She looked like she was going to be sick. And so I was actually reaching for a barf bag in the seat and turned to her. And she said, uh, no one else can play this role. And I said, what are you talking about? And it was like we were in a romantic comedy and she was proposing to me. <laughs> and she said, um, would you ever let me do this role? I have to play this part. And I remember screaming on the airplane. I was like, yes! <laughs> um, but it's the reason why the movie is what it is because 
she came to it on her own and, and knew how to do the role, why she wanted to do the role, and everything changed in that moment. And when we landed, I just said, we have to treat this movie like our marriage. We have to be as honest as possible. So let's go, page one. Is there anything in the script that bumped you? Is there anything you think that can be better? And then I stood in the living room for nights on nights on nights and just went through every single shot and walked her through it visually. So, you know, people said, what's it like directing your wife? And I said, it was a dream because I got to do it in our living room and I got to do it with our kids around. By the time we stepped on set, we were just working. You know, I wasn't directing her anymore. And you just get to harness all that is her and, and you just you just hope you had the camera on. She's she's as good as it gets. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, I've actually seen Mary Poppins Returns. And you I did? Just, okay, yeah. now you're really <laughs> bragging. <laughs> Sorry, no. Um, and I was saying, I shouldn't say this, but to Hugh Jackman yesterday, because um, he was asking me Who about is it. Who this Hugh I know, <laughs> I know. I should stop bringing him up. I was like, this is... I know this is going to be sacrilege, but I almost think she out Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. Wow, She's that's phenomenal. amazing. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's so and then beautiful. To turn around and see her in this, which is could not be further. Yeah. And how every scene is so believable and so gripping. All of you actually. Yeah. Well, I I told her I said I think this is the best performance I've ever seen, and the reason why is because how do you capture something so intense, so painful, without words, all that stuff, but also something like childbirth is so personal. Mm -hmm. I saw her do it twice. I knew she could do it. Um, <laughs> but it's funny you bring up Mary Poppins because the story I love most about Emily was I was looking for an editing bay the week before we were shooting and I went into this editing bay and who happened to be shooting down the hall was, uh, or uh, editing down the hall was Rob Marshall oh, no doing, way. yeah, Mary Poppins. And so I went in and I said, hello, if you haven't, if you don't know, he's literally the nicest person you'll ever meet. And he said, when do you guys shoot? And I said, next week. And he said, oh man, you're gonna see. And I said, I know, I love her so much. And he's like, no, you'll see. And I said, I know, I'm her number one fan. And he said, nope, not until you're in the room when she does what wow. she does will you know why you love her as an actress so much. And I thought, wow, what an amazing thing to say. And sure enough, day three, we're shooting that bathtub scene. And like I said, we had already directed it and we had gone through it. And you know, I'll, I'll sing it from the rooftops because she won't, but that is one take. That, oh my God. Yeah, that's one take that she just went to another place. And if you, if you have access to our dailies, at the end of the take, I, I literally, the air changed in the room, the entire crew couldn't speak. And then you hear me say, Let, that's lunch, we should go to lunch. Cause there's nothing, and I was blown away. I was tearing up. I had never been in the room when she does what she does. Yeah. And there was something that I've never come in contact with before. That level of talent and that level of harnessing it is insane. And then you can also hear go, by the way, what is for lunch? <laughs> and that's what's, that's what's so amazing. She does this yeah. insane thing and then yeah. she's like, is it, is it fajitas today or <laughs> what it, yeah. I'll tell you when she makes her appearance in Mary Poppins, Ugh. like 20, oh, have you seen it? Oh yeah. Oh my God, right? Oh yeah. my God. Okay, so. My only review of the movie, I won't give anything away, is 25 minutes into the movie, for the first time we were in a room like this, uh, it was set up just for Emily and I, and I stood up and walked to the back of the room, and Emily was like, oh my God, you've never done this, like maybe he hates it. And I was searching around this table, and she was like, is everything okay? Do you want me to stop it? And I was like, I just am looking for napkins. <laughs> They had given me a box of Kleenex, yeah. and within 25 minutes, I was like, pff, 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 I was done. And so I was in the back using like pretzel napkins and like wax paper. <laughs> it's, it's such a beautiful movie, and it's, it's so the movie that every yeah. single person with a heartbeat needs right now, because it's a, it's oh. a joy bomb for the world, for sure. It's, I actually was going to say I had the same reaction when she makes her appearance 20 minutes in, and I was enjoying it up to that yeah. point, but she makes it in, and I was like, that's when yeah. I started to lose <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, just start crying. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. <laughs> um, sorry, I could go on about your wife for years, so but I, I won't. <laughs> um, oh, Here she is. Yes, no. exactly. 90% of this yes. group was like, well, you should have brought her on earlier. Yeah. <laughs> She's been there. She's yes. making her way in the corner. I want to talk to Emily. <laughs> Speaking of the dailies, I heard that sometimes you had to play the monster. Oh boy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this exists somewhere. Oh, it exists. And I think it's in a vault. Um, <laughs> no, so what happened was, um, again, it's one of those experiences where the whole thing was, was the most personal experience I've ever had with anything, including the office. I've never given every molecule of myself because it was, it was father, director, actor, writer, but it was, it was father, husband, the stuff that I was trying to work with. And so I just had this vision of what I wanted to do. And so ILM, I had never done visual effects. And that is a whole, that's like a whole different level of art form and filmmaking. And 
we had this guy named Scott Farrar who worked on our movie who, if you don't know who he is, he's one of the original amazing people from ILM who, this is the type of guy that at lunch when you're telling stories about like The Office, he's like, oh yeah, you know, when uh, we were shooting Star Wars, I was the guy on the camera when the Imperial <laughs> ship comes over and you know, so I'm the first shot and I was like, oh my God. And then when we were designing the creature, he's like, yeah, when we did the kitchen scene in Jurassic Park, and I was like, oh my God. Um, and the reason you realize why they're so good at what they do is they're so detail oriented. And so he said to me, he said, you know, I got a question for you. How does this guy walk? And I was like, well, and he's like, do you know how they walk? And I said, yes, but I'm not going to do it. And he's like, oh, you, you could like act it out? And I said, yeah. So I got on the floor and did it and he recorded it on oh. his phone. <laughs> and so then when we were shooting that last scene just before Emily shoots the creature, it was this, this thing of he, we had a bunch of guys and I, he could tell that I was not quite seeing it the way that way. And he just said, put on the suit, man, go do it. And I said, am I allowed to do that? And he was like, hell yeah. He's like, let's just get this thing the way you want it. And so I put on the suit. The only problem with that is when we did the test of the movie, we didn't have visual effects in. So oh, you could wow. see the audience was like super into the movie. We were so proud of it. And then all of a sudden it's just like a shot of my van coming in, like my van sneaker. And then they pan up to me and I'm like, <laughs> and all of a sudden people are like, we do not like this movie. <laughs> we did and now we hate it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about, but there, there's been talk of maybe a sequel or continuing there, the story. There is talk, yeah. yeah so Richard. Paramount dated, <laughs> already dated oh, a sequel. Yeah, which I get it. Like I get the studio wants to make a sequel of a, of a movie that does well, but I didn't want anything to do with it. It was sort of, like I said, the most personal experience. And so I said, go find another filmmaker and another writer and, and good luck with it. Mm -hmm. And then they were meeting all these people and the producer, Drew, who's the greatest guy. I think you just had Drew and Brad, right? Here, yeah. doing the conversation? Yeah. 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 She doesn't remember. She's like, what? Well, it wasn't me. Oh, it wasn't you? Okay. I was here with you. Oh. <laughs> this Hugh guy. Um, but he, um, he just said, you know, do you, have anything, do you have anything to go on? I said, well, to me, the exciting thing is to not relive, you know, like Jaws or Alien. The cool thing we have is we have a world. It's not a repeating a sort of a villain. You get to repeat this world and live in it more. And so this was one angle of it. So, you know, I had this small idea. And he said, can you keep thinking about it for a few weeks? And I said, yeah. And he's like, just for me, like, you know, let's talk about it. And I said, sure. And then three weeks later, I had this sort of larger filled out mm. idea. And he was like, well, you write the script. <laughs> and so now I'm writing the script to this equal. Awesome. Yeah. And you'll end up directing, I'm sure. Well. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm willing to this play This is being that filmed. So. <laughs> uh, finally, I have a question from uh, Claudine Quadrak. Is that right? Oh, cool. Um, once Claudine, you know, don't speak, and you learn nothing. <laughs> in honor of your movie, we're not letting anyone else speak. Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a bogus way to go about it. You guys deserve money. <laughs> wants to know, what's a character type you've never played before you'd like to play? Oh, man, that's a great question. I don't know if this is a character type, but, you know, one of those... Um, one of those characters where the performance is the set piece kind of thing, like like a, you know, whether it's a, an autobiographical thing, but I remember watching Emily do Girl on a Train and I thought that sort of level of immersion of a, it's really less about the part that I want to play and more about the worlds that I want to explore. So for her to get to play a character where she had to dive deep into addiction and recovery and all those things, I thought that would be really cool. To, mm. to, to dive into a whole world that I don't know would be, would be pretty wonderful. And, you know, speaking of addiction and all that stuff. Stars Born, I recently saw, and I thought, yeah. I, for my money, Bradley's the best performance I've seen in a long, long time. And that sort of level of detail and obviously getting to live in a world with a character, that's, that's what I'd like to do. Mm. Um, and what is up next? You're working on season two of Jack Ryan. Season two of Jack Ryan right now, and then we finish around the holidays, and then I'm going to be writing this script, and we'll see what happens That's next. That's great. Yeah. Um, I want to apologize. I kept you longer than I was supposed to. What? And I still have questions. Oh, my God. Yes. Well, this was um, amazing. I, I can't you. tell you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. It really means a lot. Thank you guys so much. It really means so much. Thank, thank you. you. That was great. Thanks for doing this. Of course. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.